Good evening. I'm Jennifer Rabb and have the great privilege of serving as the president of this extraordinary institution, Hunter College, which I do want to point out to our distinguished guest is one of the busiest commuter schools in the country, a place located over our own subway station uh, with our own crosstown and downtown bus lines. And now that I have you all in one room under another pretense, I'd like to discuss our own transportation issues. No. Um, <laughs> Howard, I will not come. I have thought about it, but I will not commandeer this evening. Um, on behalf of our esteemed Jonathan Fenton, director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute, Harold Hoser, uh, and myself, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to a very special evening that exemplifies the mission of our Public Policy Institute. Um, as many of you know, this townhouse served for 25 years as the New York City home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt from 1908 until they left for Washington for FDR's first inauguration as President of the United States. For those of you who haven't been, us, been here be with us, um, you should know that this was a wedding present from FDR's mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt, to the happy couple, and it came with only one stipulation. Sarah would live on this side, and the happy couple would live on that side. Um, and they moved in together uh, quite soon after the nuptials in what we call the first New Deal. Um, <laughs> Eleanor was known to say that she would never see, know when she would see Sarah day or night. So if anyone here thinks they have mother-in-law issues, uh, you should think again. As you said, the house was their home while they were in Albany, while they were in Washington, but it became very important in 1921 because Sarah had had the foresight to put in an elevator in 1908, which was quite unusual at the time. And when Roosevelt was stricken with polio, he was able to come here to recover, to put his life together, to build himself his own hand-operated wheelchair that allowed him to get his mobility and put his political career back on track. He ran for governor from this home, he ran for uh, president from this home, and came home in November 1928 to find Sarah on the steps waiting for him as he emerged from the Biltmore Hotel, victorious as the next president. The New Deal it was planned in this house because, if those of you who are history buffs remember, the inauguration in those days was not until March. So from November to March 1933, this house became the place for the Brain Trust to operate. And in honor of Women's History Month, we like to really highlight the fact that Roosevelt invited Frances Perkins here, his Secretary of Labor in New York State, to ask her to become the first woman, the female cabinet secretary in the United States history. She was a strong woman and said to him that she would consider taking the position if he agreed to consider creating the first social safety net in this country, and thus the Social Security was born in this house. That was not the only uh, part of the New Deal, and that's it definitely is worth. Amidst the other revolutionary innovations invented beneath this roof, minimum wage and child labor laws, to name just two others, was an urgent focus on what we now call infrastructure. The idea of putting people to work while extending, preserving the transportation spine of what was then a bleeding country. Just here in New York, the achievement of the Public Works Administration and the Work Progress Administration included a new landing field on a strip of land near Astoria, the hub we now know as LaGuardia Airport. And LaGuardia happens to be one of the very New Deal projects being transformed now for the 21st century thanks to the work of several of our panelists who are welcoming tonight, and we thank you, and of course, under the leadership of Governor Cuomo. So what a perfect time this is to revisit those accomplishments, not only because so much was built under the federal programs incubated in this very building, but because so much of our transportation infrastructure again cries out for attention. Let me name just a few of these landmark New Deal projects. And remember, these are only New York transportation-only lists which doesn't include the parks, the post offices, the pools, or the public art that Roosevelt inspired. The list is staggering. The FDR Drive, the Triborough Bridge, improvements to the Willis Avenue, McCombs Dam, Manhattan, Queensboro, and Williamsburg Bridges, tearing down the 6th Avenue L, building the F Line, new subway stations under the 6th Avenue from Delancey Street to Rockefeller Center, the piers at 64, 88, 90, and 92, new vessels for the Staten Island Ferry, the Park Avenue Vehicular Tunnel south of Grand Central, and one little neighborhood improvement that still has daily impact on us here at Roosevelt House, 
serving as both a bonanza and a bane, the 65th Street transfers through Central Park, which we are forever grateful for both the access, but also note the cars, the trucks, the honking horns it has brought to our doors for 80 years. This is a mind-boggling list, extraordinary and daunting for any age or any transportation professional now or then. And it's all the more staggering when you remember that ground was broken on these miraculous projects in the midst of a brutal national economic depression. But while the New Deal set the bar for what was possible, the sad fact is that these projects got completed so long ago that some of them now fill the list of urgent upgrade and rehab needs facing today's transportation infrastructure and today's transportation leaders. And so we are privileged to have with us tonight the transportation or leaders of today to explore, explore both the legacy and the litany of transportation improvements so urgently critical to the region today. Before our, I introduce our experts, I want to say a few words about one transportation giant whose accomplishments and vision animate everything we do here tonight and throughout the year on this issue at Roosevelt House, by whom I mean, of course, the great Theodore Keel. Ted, as everyone called him, served as counselor to several presidents, but Roosevelt was the first he served as a rising young lawyer. <clears throat> Ted went on to become not one of New only New York's most successful attorneys, but a legendary labor mediator. Whether you were a mayor negotiating with one of the municipal unions or a newspaper publisher stuck in a protracted strike, Ted Keel was the trusted peacemaker. His interests and his achievements extended to a wide array of causes, including, of course, transportation. In particular, he was deeply concerned about what he called, quote, the fundamental conflict between development and the environment. That inspired Ted to establish the CUNY Institute for Sustainable Cities, which I am proud to say was developed and is now housed here at Hunter College. And it moved him to create the Nurture Nature Foundation to promote environmentally sensitive development. In recognition of Ted's extraordinary impact on the city and the world at large, Hunter was privileged to have bestowed an honorary degree on Ted at Roosevelt House a few years before his passing. The foundation is now led by his son, Robert, who follows in his father's footsteps as a super lawyer, gifted mediator, and vigorous defender of the environment. It is because of Robert and his sister, Jane, and the Keels family commitment to sustainability that the Keel Fellowship in Transportation Policy was created here at Roosevelt House. The program supports both faculty research and student learning. The inaugural Keel Fellow was Gridlock Sam Schwartz. And of course, this year, we are privileged to have Howard Glazer at the helm. We are profoundly grateful to the Keel family, and we're very happy tonight to welcome Robert and his wife, Leslie. And Robert, I just want you to stand so everybody can say thank you for all this incredible work. Robert and to Leslie, we're just so honored to have your confidence in carrying on the Keel name. And I think there's no better evidence of these extra than our extraordinary students in Professor Glazer's uh, class are sitting front stage, and we're looking forward to hearing their probing questions. And we know that in them, Ted's legacy lives on. We are also honored to welcome tonight's roster of New York State transportation leaders. Their bios are in your programs, and it would, their extraordinary achievements are so long and so great, it would take all evening to list them. So I ask you to take attention to these wonderful bios and join me in saying thank you to Rick Cotton, the Executive Director of the Port Authority, Pat Foy, President of the MTA, Joe Loda, Chairman of the MTA, and Scott Reckler, the real estate CEO who served five years as Port Authority Commissioner and now sits and the board of the MTA. This is truly a who's who of transportation, so I want to say thank you to all of you. <laughs> our moderator, as I said, is Howard Glazer, our 2018 Ted Keel Transportation Fellow at Roosevelt House, who has brought great vitality and wisdom to this fellowship. Howard is offering his lucky students not only the benefit of his knowledge and experience, but also giving them firsthand behind the scenes often below the scenes view of some of New York's 21st century public works in progress, something only a former New York State Director of Government Operations could make possible. 
These include inspection tours of the unfinished east side Long Island Railroad access tunnel, the catacombs beneath Grand Central Terminal, and the original subway station under City Hall. Makes you want to be a student, Howard, at Hunter College. <laughs> the only downside that Howard, who is that Howard, who once helped manage the state response to Superstorm Sandy, seems, seems to bring weather emergencies with him. I don't, <laughs> I don't know, Howard, since you started, we've had a major snowstorm, a bomb cyclone, and two <laughs> ne nor'easters, including the one I hope is not coming tomorrow. Um, Howard, it's wonderful to know that you first met Ted Keel in 1982 when you were doing scheduling for then gubernatorial candidate Mario Cuomo. Um, you worked closely in Ted's sh uh, vision by working at the start of your career with the Transit Worker Union and the LIR pu our Public Employees Unions, learning about transportation from the valuable perspective of the labor movement. Truly in the spirit of Ted Keel, Howard has focused since leaving government on public-private partnerships to guarantee transportation rights as a civil right, on mobility, accessibility, and the vital role of transportation in the shared economy. Howard, we know you bear the Ted Keel name very proudly, and we know that Ted would be proud to have you in this fellowship. We are very honored to have you here with us. Um, and the fact that you've put together this extraordinary panel is just one indication of the work that you've been doing at Hunter College. Thank you for being with us, and the show Thank is you. yours. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you, Madam President. I say that every time I possibly can. I'll do it every <laughs> single time. Uh, thank you for your leadership uh, of Hunter College and your vision for Roosevelt House, which is really a stunning testament to uh, what we can do here in New York City and what we hope we'll continue to do. And also my thanks to Harold Holzer, my friend of 30 years, a great Lincoln scholar, a great gentleman. Uh, we are going to discuss uh, Lincoln tonight, Harold, that's the good news. Bad news is it's the Lincoln Tunnel. <laughs> I want to also offer my personal thanks uh, to the Keel family. It's a privilege uh, to occupy uh, the, uh, the position that, that bears his name. Uh, the, the civic virtues that Ted Keel stood for sometimes seem a little bit, can seem a little bereft today, but I have to tell you that um, if you came into my classroom, uh, you would know how uh, the Keel spirit lives on in a very powerful way today, and we appreciate everything you've done to support this fellowship and, and our class here. So again, thank you to the Keel family. So we have a distinguished panel here. It is the right time, I think, for the right panel. This is a profoundly stressful time for the transportation system in New York. It's an aging system. Uh, as the president pointed out, uh, it was the envy of the world, but that was in the first half of the 1900s. And today it's uh, dealing with a stress uh, and a capacity that it was never designed to handle. At the same time, as you have an aging system, uh, you have tremendous new investments in that system. Uh, $100 billion, many of which uh, you are all in charge of today. And that's creating change. And at the same time that that's happening, you have new technologies, you have changes in work patterns, you have changes in where we live. Any one of these things would be worthy probably of a semester of our class. And they're all happening all at once at the same time. And that is creating uh, a lot of public scrutiny at the same time. So I hope what we'll have tonight is uh, a civic and civil discussion in the Keel spirit uh, with, uh, with the, the custodians of our transportation system. I want to start by just actually reading you a quote, uh, if I might take another minute. Here it is. Uh, the fundamental principle behind the plan is that car travel and mass transit are interrelated, like two sides of an equation, two weights counterpoised on a scale. Ideally, there should be a balance, but instead our system is enormously unconscionably out of balance. Charging a fair price for automobile travel can diminish the awful gridlock in our city and in other cities worldwide. We owe it to the people of this city and to those across the world to begin fashioning a balanced system for getting around our urban areas. The year was 2008. Ted Keel is the author of that quote and the seminal study that he did back in 2008 when the Bloomberg administration started talking about congestion pricing. Here we are a decade later, maybe poised for some change. Let me ask you, I know that you've been very involved, Scott and Joe, you've been very involved in congestion pricing. What, what's changed since Ted Keel uttered those words when it seemed like almost an impossibility? Joe? 
technology has changed. Uh, technology is a lot easier now than back in 2008. As you know, the Tribal Bridge and Tunnel Authority or MTA Bridges and Tunnels now is all cashless. Using the easy pass, you can just ride right through uh, and you get charged. That same type of technology is now available. Um, you know, it's being used similar in London right now where they have congestion pricing in their central business district. Uh, and it has the ability to have allow variable pricing. It, it, it requires, you know, a tremendous amount of software and programming necessary to do it. But that's what's different now than what So it's, it's easier to do, right, because we have the technology. The previously talking about tolling vehicles coming into New York City sounded kind of nightmarish, creating its own mini congestion at the bridges. But it's not just the technology that's changed, right? It's also something's happened in the political fabric. Something else has changed, and, and um, bear with me because you need to hear the end of it because the beginning of it is not going to sound correct. We, we started down the path of uh, narrowing our streets by putting in bike lanes, which I think are absolutely necessary, and it is part of the future. But we did it without having a conversation as to how we would work and what the rules of engagement would be for bicyclists as well as cars, uh, because we have an enormous amount of double parking right now that's causing congestion. Our streets are like, they're arteries and they're clogged. And whenever it's clogged, any artery is clogged, your heart's gonna stop. And that's pretty much where we are right now. And so I think part of what um, uh, Mayor Bloomberg did, went in, it absolutely went in the right direction. But the education, the training, the uh, information back and forth that was necessary with the public didn't happen. And I think the result is now this enormous congestion that's going on. Yes, I would just add that, uh, you know, I actually have had this conversation with Mayor Bloomberg, and when he talks about his pro that process back in 2008, he was trying to be proactive and describe to the public what was on the horizon in terms of population growth, in terms of additional congestion, and putting a plan in place before the crisis. Unfortunately, I think our system today, uh, it's hard to make proactive policy as a matter of, as even a matter of how well grounded it is without actually first having the crisis. And I think we're now living in the crisis with this transit crisis. And so I think the time has come because every person who's trying to take a bus that's going four to five miles an hour and would rather walk or sees the problems that we have with our transit system below ground recognizes that we can't just go on as if uh, we're going to be living on the investments from the generations of the past. We've got to invest uh, in our future. And there is no other source of revenue. So you solve two problems here. You actually reduce congestion on our streets uh, as at the same time as you create a, a funding source to actually uh, a dedicated new funding source to fund our transit system. The other thing to your point on technology is clearly uh, for hired vehicles, right? If you think taxis, we had 15,000, uh, we have 15,000 or so yellow cabs in New York City. We have somewhere between 50,000, 75,000 for hire vehicles. It's a great, it's a great uh, product. I'm a big user of them, but it's changed the dynamic as well uh, in the mix. Same thing with e-commerce. We have 30% more deliveries in the last three years. Think about all the trucks that are double parked uh, in the streets. Tourism's at a new record. We had now 40% more, four times rather as many tourist busts driving around New York City that basically are, their whole mission is to go slow in the middle of the road so everyone can see what's happening, but that's what's happening, right? So there's a lot of di these dynamics that have created the current environment that we're in that's not gonna go away unless we do something bold and proactive. You can almost feel it in the city, the difference from 10 years ago, just trying to get, try to get cross town in Manhattan today. It is, I think it's four miles per hour now in the central business district, seven miles per hour. Uh, on average, it's not the system that was envisioned in 1904 when this when the system uh, opened. The money is significant potentially, right? Billion and a half dollars is what's projected when congestion pricing is fully up and going. And we're talking about dedicating all of that to the MTA. Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's the, dedicated. Right. So I think there'll be some. Joe's like he's dazed by that number yeah, of right. a billion and a half dollars. I'm gonna let somebody extra. else answer right. that. I mean, I think the, the, the from where it, it's it's a for, it's a billion to a billion and a half dollars, depending on what the the different rates are for the different in time zones, etc. There's a whole menu of options that were put forward by the panel that put this together, and there is there'll probably be some leakage of that money, like everything in politics, that would go to <laughs> support some of the the boroughs and some of the uh, d d transit deserts that are around the city that need support, maybe even the suburbs that are going to be affected by this. But the vast majority 
needs to go to uh, to fix the New York City transit uh, system. And Pat, I want you to jump in any time, but go ahead, please. Jump. So, so one thing to think about with the uh, cash that's generated uh, by congestion pricing is it to use it to expand the system. Yes. Is it used to repair the system? Absolutely. But we've also embarked back in 2009 uh, the idea that we would have a fare and toll increase every right. two years, and we're scheduled right. to have one again next year. The, the idea is can we use some of that money to also offset future increases in uh, the well, amount of Well, that was, you know, the original Keel plan, if you remember this. Do you know how much it was to drive into Manhattan under the Keel plan to drive a car to Central Business District was over $50. But the trade-off was, according to the numbers at the time, is that it would eliminate the subway fare. And at least that concept was the vision. So there's some echoes of that. I know you see you shaking your head. But there's some echoes of that in utilizing the revenue to try to present some fair relief. Is there a danger, uh, though? Howard, I just yeah, to, please. Pat. Okay to call you Howard. Uh, I, th I think <laughs> pr Professor, uh, Professor Glazer is also okay. <laughs> Uh, the, the point I wanted to make briefly is you've heard from MTA board members, elected officials, editorial pages about the MTA's need for capital. It's true. Today it was confirmed by S&P, right, which downgraded our bonds one, one niche. And one of the significant points that S&P made in the report is the MTA's need for sustainable increasing revenue. And uh, hopefully there aren't more downgrades in the future, but I think having a third-party credit agency make that point is pretty powerful. Well, so the congestion pricing plan, and you helped lead the Fix New York uh, panel, is uh, we're now three weeks from the state budget, due on April 1st. It was uh, something that the governors discussed, put the panel together. Uh, with the time remaining, is it realistic? What will we see happen? Any prognostications or inside information on what might happen with congestion pricing over the next month? By the way, for the students right here, there. I just want to say, you see, if you want to get into the transportation business, we either got to be bald or going to end up with gray hair. So <laughs> know what you're getting yourself into to start this process. I but they, they, right, Either way. They, right, they didn't agree. start that way. I just want you to know. Exactly. The, um, I, I, mean, this, it, it's, I was up in Albany last week, and Pat was up there, too. It's a hard, it's a hard uh, uh, assessment right now. I mean, you know, it's an election year. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of nuances to this. The one thing I will say is that the plan... Um, has focused on phasing this in, which not only uh, makes sense in terms of the uh, the politics of it, but it makes sense of the policy because you really can't start charging big uh, congestion pricing tolls and forcing people underground before the subways are functioning at, at some level of capacity, before the bus system is functioning at some level of capacity. And so there is a phase that if uh, the legislature wants to take where they could actually implement some elements where they would uh, be able to start charging for hired vehicles, start uh, putting situations into where you can have enforcement to open up the bus lanes by using cameras and other things like that that would enable us to bring some funding in to get the subway action plan done and then be in a position next year to go forward with the full uh, implementation. So, so let the legislature ease in to the process a little bit, right? And these, remember, these are you have a suburban Republican Senate. The suburban Senate has never been a big fan of uh, charging money to come into New York City, but they also, they need money too. At the end of the day, we know how things are in Albany. You've got to have a budget. You've got to have it, you know, by a deadline or near to a deadline, and the governor's been very good about utilizing that kind of pressure. Um, let, me, let me stay with congestion just for a little bit, and this is maybe a little bit of a, a, a stretch from it, Rick. Um, there are about 8,000 buses a day that come through that Lincoln Tunnel. Uh, back and forth, contributing to a lot of uh, a lot of gridlock, both on the Manhattan side and in the surrounding streets. In fact, a large number of those buses they come over in the morning from New Jersey because today they're primarily commuter buses. I used to think about Port Authority when I was young is where all the out of town buses came in, but it's mostly commuter buses from New Jersey. They come in in the morning at rush hour. They drop their passengers. They go back empty, park in New Jersey. They come back again at rush hour, pick up their passengers, and go back again. Right? And you've got uh, hundreds, if not a thousand, buses a day doing that. Uh, you have uh, a large increase in the number of people coming from New Jersey and projected to continue to do so. Uh, the Port Authority bus terminal, been talking about it for years, on and off. 
there was a proposal, I think, when, when Scott was there and Pat were there, even to put it on the New Jersey side. And that way, relieve some of the congestion on the New York side, rebuild a bus terminal there, and put people on rail to come over. So I haven't heard much about that. What's the status currently of the, the bus terminal plan, rebuild in place, rebuild on the west side of Manhattan, uh, maybe in New Jersey, and where, where are we today with that? Well, as um, the decisions that were made and embodied in the uh, Port Authority Capital Plan, which was uh, adopted uh, actually under Pat a year ago, uh, fundamentally made that decision, which is that the current bus terminal will be rebuilt. Uh, that process is, uh, the preliminary part of that process is underway. It is still in the planning stage. Uh, what has been the most recent development on in that is a alternative for rebuilding the bus terminal in place um, is been developed. It is currently being analyzed in terms of expense and constructability, but the early signs are promising. And the next step in the process will be to put alternatives, that will be one, um, out for uh, analysis as part of the environmental review. After which, uh, just in terms of the normal process of building, one then moves to an actual uh, construction uh, proposal. So we're still in the, in the early stages, but the goal is uh, by uh, the mid-2020s uh, uh, to have a new facility, uh, which will be larger uh, by a significant amount. And the question that you're raising is beyond the bus terminal, right. uh, what are the alternatives in terms of expanded trans-Hudson capacity? There right. is a particular uh, leading option that uh, absolutely 100% needs uh, to be, uh, uh, need, uh, people need to move forward on. Uh, it is the gateway tunnel project. Uh, it, it has to happen. There's no alternative to it. Not to move forward on it would be unconscionable. Uh, the two states, New York and New Jersey, uh, have committed to put up half the cost this is, uh, the existing tunnel is deteriorating. Uh, if you've been reading the papers, uh, that point has been made repeatedly. It is in extreme danger of failing. Uh, the, talk is, the clock is ticking. And it is, uh, it is actually a federal asset. So it is owned and operated by Amtrak. And the proposal which the Obama administration embraced which is for the two states to pay half the cost and for the federal government to step up and pay the other half it is a very sensible and fair solution. And the ball is now in the court in the, of the federal government. And uh, unfortunately, there is uh, at least one voice that is uh, uh, raised objections. And hopefully, uh, the funding decision, which is in the hands of the Congress at the moment, will be to move forward on the project. Rick doesn't want to say the one name that is standing in the way, but I'll, you probably figured out, but I'll read you this quote, uh, which is not 10 years ago, but it's two weeks ago, and it echoes what you just said, Rick. It's all, this is, by the way, when I say quote, it's a tweet, because that is what we have for civic discourse today. <laughs> Here's the quote. It's only a matter of time before the tunnels under the Hudson River fail. At real Donald Trump, stop playing Russian roulette with the safety and economic vitality of our region and pay the government's half of the gateway project as originally promised. Anyone want to take responsibility for that quote? Okay, it's Scott Reckler. <laughs> i tell you what's astonishing to me though is that Rick just said the same thing and when I first saw this quote I thought how impolitic it was, you know, something that you would probably not have said as a vice chair of the Port Authority maybe three or four years ago. But the fact that the executive director of the Port Authority can come here today, and I'm sure we all agree, and say that these tubes are going to fail. And they have 450 trains a day, not just to New York, but also to the Northeast Corridor, 200,000 people a day. But the question becomes, what is the path forward? Uh, the economic vitality of the city does rely on it, so does perhaps a good portion of the country, and there's a matter of safety. 
So where, Pat, where do you see it going? I, I want to make the following point, which is there's two scenarios for failure of the, uh, of the existing tunnels. W one is by whimper, and the other one is by kind of a catastrophic failure. The catastrophic failure uh, obviously would be a disaster on every level, and thousands of people uh, could perish. But the more likely outcome, and the one that could occur much sooner, right, is the most conservative engineer at Amtrak examines the tunnel and comes to a conclusion that they've got to close or that capacity's got to be cut by 50%. And there's talk in some circles about the tunnel will go on for 10 years and maybe it'll fail eight, nine, or 10 years. That could happen. It's built in, it's built in 1910, the two tunnels, right? 1910 or so. Over 110 years yeah. old. And, and, and the other thing is, in the world we live in, uh, a world where some public officials sometimes get sued or prosecuted, the most conservative engineer in Amtrak is unlikely to be contradicted by any of his colleagues from Amtrak or an engineering firm. So when, when we talk about it, it could be years, well, it could be years, but it could also literally be weeks or months. So what the administration is doing is totally irresponsible, full stop. Anybody commuting to New Jersey through the tunnels tonight? Because <laughs> I'm definitely not. Uh, well, look, a related issue to this is the, is the infrastructure plan that's been put forward by, please go ahead, Jeff. Let me, let me uh, take the Long Island Railroad point of view for one second. It has the other tunnel on the East River, right. just as old, right. just as in need of repair. And it is a single point of failure in that if it does not, op if it does not operate, you cannot get into Manhattan on the Long Island Railroad. So, you know, this focusing on just the Hudson River, I also hope focus on the East River as well, because these two tunnels or the tunnels need to be fixed. Well, you know, that brings us to the overall question of infrastructure, and even though the Trump administration is not where, um, where we would say we'd want them to be on these tunnels, there is an infrastructure plan. It's a fairly broad one from the White House. The Trump administration has put forward a $200 billion plan. Uh, city and states have been lukewarm at best and harshly critical, uh, probably for the most part. Don't we need the $200 billion? Wouldn't it address some of these issues? What's wrong with the White House... What's wrong with the White House plan, Pat? You and Rick, you've been up and down this issue a long time. Yeah, look, it's uh, less money than it appears, one. Uh, sorry, it's less money than it appears, one. And two, even worse than that, it's actually less money when you do the calculations than the federal government spent last year and, and the year before that. Mm -hmm. there, there's not a lot of there, there. It assumes two things. One is that many fiscally stressed or on the verge of bankruptcy states and cities are going to be able to come up with extraordinary sums of money in a lot of cases, and New York State is an incredible credit, right, uh, and trades, you know, three or four basis points below what, you know, 10-year treasuries trade. But, but the other thing it assumes, and the Port Authority has been, been, been a leadership at, uh, on this, it assumes that all these projects are going to get financed with private capital. Uh, you know, LaGuardia is being done as a P3. The Gothels Bridge is being done as a P3. We're exploring, uh, you know, on a preliminary level, P3s at, at, at the Port Authority. I expect, you know, I'll let Rick speak for himself. But there's not enough private capital to finance these things, not because there isn't availability of money. The world's awash with private money looking for returns. A, a P3 project like LaGuardia or Gothels needs a recurring source of income that's not subject to a legislative appropriation. There's a limited number, especially in the transportation field, of projects that fit that mold. Uh, I guess I'd make three points, just which is picking up on what Pat says. In terms of the last point, this is going to sound a little nerdy, but uh, you need both a source of funding and a source of financing. And what the private sector provides is financing, not funding. Someone's so, got to, someone so, has to pay. Someone has right? to pay. It is the recurring source of income. And so you either need a, a locality that is prepared itself to come up with significant capital at a time when state and local governments are very hard pressed or you have to be prepared to charge for usage of a particular facility. Second, just to uh, re-emphasize uh, the comment about the proposed infrastructure uh, program from, from Washington, the $200 billion is over 10 years. That is $20 billion a year. First point to make is the one Pat did, which is the administration has proposed cuts in existing infrastructure program that are vastly larger than what they propose in terms of their $20 billion a year. Second point to make is that as candidate, 
uh, Mr. Trump promised a trillion dollar program. What have we've wound up with is not a trillion dollar program, but a $20 billion a year program. And in terms of the overall need, it really doesn't come close. All right, we're spending that on two projects, essentially, right. in New York right now. Scott. Just, you know, I just want to just add to this. I had the, um, I guess called opportunity to uh, advise the Trump transition team on infrastructure before they went to the White House and laid out an infrastructure plan that was a trillion uh, dollar infrastructure plan. And the funding of that was the repatriation of dollars that went to ultimately fund the tax cuts that just occurred. And so as soon as that happened, the, 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 you know, basically our fate was made, right? There was no longer that trillion or trillion and a half dollars that was gonna ultimately come to fund infrastructure. The money's not there anymore. And, and that's the, and so whatever anyone says at this point, and even if you heard uh, Senator Schumer when he talked about the Democratic plan was to basically to repeal the tax cuts to ultimately pay for infrastructure. So the trade's been made, uh, and you know, personally, while I benefit from the tax cuts, I would rather invest in our future uh, for the infrastructure, and I think a lot of people feel that way, but uh, the case is done. So are you saying really, we're, we're, are we on our own in terms of federal aid, given the impact of the tax cuts on the deficit, the unlikeliness of, unlikelihood of Republican Congress, you know, voting to increase the deficit in order to pay for infrastructure projects that are primarily going to go to big places like New York, where that's they don't come from. Uh, you know, what's what's the what's the alternative if we don't have a federal source of information yeah, so, of, of funding? So I I think we are on our own. I would say first of all, I would say I think we're fortunate that we're in a state like New York where we have a a, a governor who's willing to be bold to have a hundred billion dollars in infrastructure where we do have. Uh, demand from people from around the world that want to live here, be here, which then creates revenue streams that fund us to be able to actually even afford congestion pricing, right? So this, we're in a place different than other places around the country that actually can find ways to use user fees, congestion pricing to create revenue streams if need be. Uh, the Gateway Tunnel, to the, the point Rick and Pat were making, that actually was going to have a user fee uh, that was going to ultimately, over a 35-year period, uh, repay the cost uh, of, of loans that the New York and New Jersey was going to borrow from the federal government. But I, we're almost at a point, and I know I wrote that, uh, that uh, what you call it? Not political, which it was a... I, I said it was a beautifully thought out <laughs> whatever, whatever it was. <laughs> I, I've actually started to rethink that a little bit to that point, and because I've watched the negotiations that uh, Rocket Man has had with our president. <laughs> and I, I, I think maybe we're approaching it the wrong way. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I think, I think we're onto something. No, yeah. but I, I, I'm sincere. You know, here's, and th this is the politics of it all. First, we know this president doesn't want to honor anything that the former administration did, right? If, if Obama made the deal, he doesn't want to be part of that deal. So he wants to start from scratch. So he's telling you that until we start from scratch and say that doesn't exist, he's going to keep telling us that, that you know, everything but doing the deal. The second thing is, he keeps saying $30 billion, we're not spending $30 billion at a $200 billion infrastructure plan or even a billion dollars, $30 billion isn't going to this. The reality is there's elements, and we've had this discussion amongst us before of this gateway project, that you can at least narrow that down. Is it 30 billion, is it 15 billion, does $10 billion at least get us the new tunnels to at least give us some redundancy and then you phase in the balance later? And the third thing about your point on your, on your own, I mean, we've done it on our own. We've done it at the World Trade Center. We've floated bonds um, by using uh, fees and future revenue streams that were gonna be coming. We did it at the airport. And we might need to at least, for this pur purpose, swallow our pride a little bit and say to, if we, to the federal government, okay, we'll fund our half on our own. We'll reduce it from 30 billion to 10 billion. Um, and you now step to the table for your half and let's see what happens. Well, let me, let me stay with the wonky financing just for a moment since we're, we're kind of circling around that. Um, there are limited sources of who can pay for these tremendous infrastructure needs. Uh, you have the traditional sources are the users are going to pay through a fare or a toll. The federal, state, or local government is going to provide an outright share, uh, broad-based taxes, dedicated taxes, or debt. We appear to be reaching our limit on a lot of these, especially the debt, which we're talking about today, perhaps the, the downgrade. So one idea that's been discussed, and I think it's part of the task forces that you've all served on, is the idea of value capture. And it's the concept that an increase in value in the real estate of the area that is served by the transit, a share of that should come back to pay for the transit system. 
It's not a particularly new idea. Mayor Bloomberg used it uh, more or less to pay for the number seven train extension Hudson Yards. and Hudson Yards. And one reason it got done as quickly as it did is essentially you taxed the real estate value at Hudson Yards and the city went and did it on its own, effectively without, uh, without the state and went ahead and did it. Is that a viable source or is it just another shifting of the burden of who pays onto the real estate community and maybe the, you know, the taxes end up flying uh, in a different direction anyway? No, I, I think it's a viable source. It's important to note Governor Cuomo included in his executive budget in the middle of January a value capture provision, which is being discussed and negotiated in Albany right now. When you think about it, Howard, uh, August Belmont, right, who built one of yeah. the first subway lines, yeah. was, was a real estate owner and operator right. and did it to enhance the value of his uh, real estate. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Value capture is basically based on the principle. Second Avenue Subway is a great example and in some ways a missed opportunity for the MTA, right? Uh, Second Avenue Subway has created an incredible appreciation in real estate wealth, both commercial and industrial, in the catchment, catchment area around Second Avenue Subway and resulted happily in an increase of real property taxes for the city of New York. That's a good thing. The bad news is the MTA didn't participate in that. And what Joe and I and others at the MTA have been working on is a value capture provision. We were happy to see it included in the governor's provision. One, one, one important thing to note, two, two things maybe. One is the Second Avenue, the appreciation occurring as a result of stage one of Second Avenue subway would not have occurred but for the MTA investment, so point one. Therefore, the MTA sharing in that going forward is a totally appropriate thing to do. And the third thing I'll note is the proposal that is being discussed in Albany provides that no real property owner will pay an additional dollar of tax as a result of the MTA sharing in the capture. Real estate taxes as the MTA bills new projects are going to go up, right? But no real estate owner as a result of the MTA's share, whether it's 50% or 75% or some other percentage is going to share, Given what Joe and I talked about, the financial condition of the MTA and the downgrade that occurred today, uh, value capture, I think, is a, is a fitting and appropriate way to finance some of these large projects. Yeah, I mean, from a real estate uh, owner's perspective, I'm a big fan of, of value capture. And, uh, you so know, all I mean, that money that you save from the federal tax credit, you were willing to put back into the infrastructure. Exactly. In but the but, but I, your point is that it, uh, you know, infrastructure creates real estate value. Without infrastructure, there is no real estate value. And, and give you a little bit of an inverse story, we have a, a development that we're doing in Long Island on the waterfront. Um, it's, it's a 100-acre development that took 10 years to get approved. Once it was approved for a billion dollar development, the city didn't have any money for infrastructure. So to the point of taking things in your own hand, we made a deal with the city to allocate money to a, a trust uh, that would then go to pay for infrastructure. And now we're building the $150 million of infrastructure that's gonna be funded by the uh, real estate tax value that's created from the development we're gonna build that was then uh, issued bonds to institutions around the United States. So no government other than a reallocation of real estate taxes they didn't have, which is basically what Pat's saying. Right. They never had the real estate taxes to start with. They're giving up 60% of what they would have otherwise gotten, but they wouldn't get it if we don't do it. Right. Is that viable, Joe, for the Second Avenue subway going forward? I think it is viable going forward, but I also want to uh, point out that New York is unique is one of the states that doesn't allow value capture. Um, the, while it's new to New York, it happens almost every state in this country uh, Chicago has financed its transit system uh, using value capture, what they call tax increment financing. Same has happened in Los Angeles, and it's happening in Europe as well. So it is a very common way in which uh, you know transit can share in the increase in, in property values going on. So I want to take a moment just for a little bit of housekeeping. You should have on your seats there are uh, question cards, and I see some people have them. So if you have cards and you want to or you already have written out a question, you can put your name or not put your name in. Just a couple of minutes, I'm going to ask, I don't know, Brenna, Brenna Hemmings, are you, are you in the house? Brenna's over there. Brenna will come by, just stand up so we can see you. One of my students, Brenna. Brenna will come by in just a minute and grab those cards from you when you see her come down the aisle. Um, I also want to, I promised I would do this, um, in case you didn't have enough uh, of transit in general, and Joe Loda in particular, uh, <laughs> Sarah Near, uh, New York, uh, New York Times. Where is Sarah? Hello, well, way in the back. Good seats for the Times. Uh, she's. Uh oh. <laughs> um, Sarah has been hosting this tremendous series uh, of conversations on all kinds of interesting topics at the Museum of the City of New York, and she is hosting Joe Loda and Veronica Vanderpool. 
from the MTA on Wednesday, March 21st. So if, uh, if I didn't get the right questions here for Joe, you'll have another chance on March 21st. Thank you very much, Sarah, for doing, uh, for doing that. Um, we, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, uh, P3s, public-private partnerships, mentioned uh, LaGuardia Airport, really part of WPA. Uh, back in the days, 1939 is when LaGuardia really became uh, an operating field. Uh, if you go by there today, there is something bursting out of the ground currently that just wasn't there a year ago. And, you know, we get a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion about uh, Joe Biden's comments about third world airports and LaGuardia Airport, but clearly something is happening and happening fast there. Did it happen faster because of the P3 than you think the Port Authority or any government agency could have done it if it was designing it and building it itself? And how's it going over there? And uh, can we get to the airport in less than 25 minutes from Midtown? Soon, soon. Yeah, soon. Uh, yes. Well, I mean, it, it is a, um, uh, I, I say this to my friends, which is uh, the the uh, commitment on the part of the Port Authority to uh, initiating the construction project occurred under Pat. It was back in 2015 when the actual, the Port Authority approved it. It broke ground um, relatively quickly at, right af um, after the final approval, which was uh, a year and a half ago. And uh, Generally, and that right now, Howard, as you say, I have people coming up to me saying, you mean it's really going to get built? So uh, the answer is yes, it's really going to get built. And it has, it is moving along faster in part. You have to th separate out public-private partnerships. So there are two elements to it. One is design-build. The other is the financing, operating, and maintain. Both of them take advantage of private sector expertise, but in different ways. The big factor in terms of the speed of construction is the design-build uh, contracting approach. And and just, the, just so people explain what that is well, in so case I, you're not right. deep in the weeds so on this, sounds, but actually it's pretty critical. Right. It, it, sounds, it sounds nerdy, but it has a real-world impact, which is the typical way that the government has historically approached construction is they have a procurement which procures the design of whatever it is they want to build. The government procurements take a long time. Then the second step, having a design, that design was put out to build for the construction company to bid in order to build it. You then, so now you're through two procurements. What you come out with is a contract with a contractor to build a design that was done by somebody else. So what you then bought is a series of finger pointing where the construction firm says, to, uh, well, I was hired to build a design, which is, when you get into the details, unbuildable, and therefore there is added right. time, added expense. The designer, of course, says, and to the extent you've done residential construction, you may be familiar with this process. The designer says, look, the contractor has no idea what they're doing, and so they wind up, you wind up in a finger-pointing contest, you wind up with lawsuits back and forth, and you wind up with a schedule and a budget that becomes under huge pressure. Design-build approaches it completely differently. It puts out, in a single procurement, a request for proposal from a consortium, from a joint venture, which has the designer and the builder in the same contractual entity. And what the government does is to say, we want a facility that meets these performance characteristics. And what we want is the best design and the fastest construction possible at a fixed price. And so you have the designer and the builder in the same venture. They look for smart, creative, private sector um, approaches, which winds up with a design that is able to be built more efficiently and at a faster pace because that is part of the competitive pressures on them. And so <clears throat> once you have an award to that partnership, the partnership can break ground even if they haven't completely finished the design. Right. So the result at LaGuardia, this is a design build as well as a second phase of it, which I'll come to in a second, 
is that they can break ground, they can move forward quickly. They're, they have committed to a schedule. They can't complain about the design. It's their design. The, hmm. the uh, contractor is under a fixed price and a fixed schedule. And so what you wind up with is what you see, which is a construction project that steps up much more rapidly where the risk has been shifted to the private sector in terms of both cost and schedule. And you really wind up with a project that moves forward much more effectively. Now, if I recall correctly, it's basically illegal in a broad swath of New York State agencies, or has that changed? Well, it's not authorized, bizarrely. Yeah, it's so, illegal. Right. So the fact is... <laughs> if you tried to do See, it, now, they'd come now take you, you can, away. Right. <laughs> you can speak that way. Um, so the, uh, the, uh, the result is that actually there is a restricted number of agencies who can take advantage of that. Uh, is the MT, are you guys able to do that uh, throughout the system at this First point? In First in the state to do it. Yeah, it makes a tremendous difference. Sorry, I just build on what Rick said to talk for a second about the P3 piece, right? So the Port Authority did LaGuardia Central Terminal building the first half of the airport. And, you know, as Rick noted, it's an $8 billion project in total. It's extraordinary. And, and the Gothels Bridge as, as P3s. So why do we do that? The Port Authority didn't need the funding. But what it, what it was able to do was to shift the risk of construction and the schedule risk to a well-capitalized third party. In the case of Gothel's, a firm that put up $100 million bucks. In the case of LaGuardia, $200 million bucks. But, but also, Port Authority's got incredibly talented engineers, and on Gothel's and LaGuardia, they came up with pretty cool designs. The private sector on both projects came up with a better project that was better not only for the Port Authority, but customers on the bridge and customers at, at LaGuardia, especially in terms of minimizing, people are gonna be inconvenienced at LaGuardia, but the, the, the P3 team significantly reduced the amount of inconvenience to customers over a period of years. That's why we picked them. I just wanna add one more thing from my experience with this, because when we were at the Port Authority, we had two bridges that we were doing at the same time. One was Gothel's, and one was Bayonne, and the New York side decided to do the public-private partnership with Gothels, and New Jersey, who was in charge of Bayonne, went with, to do it on um, through the agency itself, and Gothels was done on time and on budget, and the Bayonne was hundreds of million dollars over budget and greatly delayed. But part of that is, it's the, it's the beginning process, and we see this even at the MTA, is that you, you're anxious politically to move projects forward. And early in a project, you really don't know what it's gonna cost. So someone throws out a number, and people say, okay, this makes sense, and people assume that's the number. The, the, in a public-private partnership, you don't get away with that because if you're passing on that risk to the private sector, the private sector is not gonna begin the project until they've done enough work to understand all the risks and develop all the mitigants before they move forward. So the other thing the public-private sector uh, partnerships do is it protects us from politics pushing us until we have all the true answers and in plan in place, because if you have all the answers, you may either A, not move forward, or B, value engineer the project to something that you can actually afford within your budget. And I think that's key, even the transportation hub down at the World Trade Center, I think we started that when 30, 40% of the plans were done. Think about if you were doing your own home and you had 30, 40% of your plans and someone gave you a budget, if you thought that would be realistic. It's not realistic, you can't rely on it. My class will remember the first rule of cost estimating, but you don't have to say out loud what that, what that rule is. Uh, so it sort of begs the question, you have these tremendous infrastructure projects that you guys are all managing right now. You have uh, east side access to a $12 billion project now scheduled for 2023, you know, very years late in the making. Second Avenue subway, three more phases to go, very successful, accelerated first phase, but still three phases to go, Penn Station renovation, a multi-billion dollar project, uh, LaGuardia Airport's three billion, I think JFK, you're looking at a five billion dollar project uh, over there, and, and the list goes on. Um, it, are your agencies, which are primarily operating agencies, Joe, your job is to run the system, and this is what people are worried about every day, is operating the system. Same thing, Rick, running the roads and bridges, the airports. Does it make sense to have this dual role of building these enormously complicated projects and overseeing them and trying to get them in the ground while you're trying to make the trains run on time? Or is there a better system in which you could segregate, potentially, all of these projects into a transportation capital construction corporation 
which could just focus on getting them right, managing the P3s, moving them forward so that you could be freed to do the job that you have as your number one priority. Does it make any sense at all? It's been talked about in the past. I don't know if RPA has weighed in it on it or not. RPA gets to go first here. <laughs> Look, there are numerous ways in which you can structure how a, an operating agency builds things in the future. You can separate the two. The thing that's really important is to understand what is it um, that needs to be built and uh, understand who the client is and understand that it's built in the right way. We've seen situations at the MTA, for example, the extension of the number seven train where it was built by what's called MTA Capital Construction, a separate organization, who then turned it over to the transit authority and the transit authority said, well, we've got to rebuild and retool some of the things that you built because it's not up to our specs. Well, the reality is, you know, there needs to be an understanding of the client. That all goes away when you have a situation that uh, Scott has described. And I think it's one in which requires an enormous amount of coordination. Well, I'd, I'd make one. Uh, everything's compared to what, right? And if right. you, the, the, <clears throat> the big promise of design build is that it in fact turns the management of the project heavily over to the private sector with severe financial penalties if it isn't delivered on time. I think you're absolutely right. The government does not know how to do construction. Underlying design build is a recognition of that and a much, much stronger reliance on private sector management of the project. And I think if you look, I mean, this may be a little selective, but if you look at the Tappan Zee Bridge, which is on time absolutely. and on budget, yeah. if you look at uh, the Gothels Bridge, which is on time and on budget, if you look at, uh, it's obviously still in the middle, but Moynihan is on time and on budget. And so if you look at the government's experience with design build contracts, at least in many of them, it is much better than the historic design bid build. So uh, again, you can make the case, it's always going to be a challenge to manage these projects, but at least that tool gives the government, I think, a significant step forward in management. Yep, I would agree, and I think that that's part, you know, part of the challenge right now is we're asking the public for more money when our track record, um, and you read the litany of them, right, yep. has been so poor in terms of being able to deliver on time and on budget that people think by giving the agencies money, they're putting it into a black hole. And having projects like uh, Rick just noted or what LaGuardia ultimately would be, hopefully the third track in Long Island Railroad would be, will be examples of how you can use new means to actually bring projects in on time and on budget and regain the public's trust. But I think to just say fund us money without having that well thought out and described, I think the, you know, the public should say, hold off, I don't want to give you that money uh, at that point. The other point I just want to make on agencies, because now living in two of them and working in the private sector, you know, if you think about private sector, you think about what's happening in conglomerates. They're being broken up because they're so hard to manage. Look at GE, right? I mean, what has happened? And they don't even have to deal with the politics that agencies have to deal with. You have to deal with politics at these agencies? And so wow. these are extraordinarily, like right, extraordinarily <laughs> complex, uh, you know, complex organizations. And I do think, that, you know, if you were going to redesign them today with a blank piece of paper, you wouldn't design them as they are right now. Because it's impossible to have as many different disciplines under one agency and one management team and one board, frankly, uh, as uh, as you have in these agencies. And so that's something over time, I think, that needs to be addressed. And actually, corporate failures and bankruptcies are a positive thing, right? Because they're market clearing, and they take capital and expertise away from failed business models and give it to, uh, you know, the guy or the woman who's got the, the, the better model. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen in government much. And the, uh, the, the, the virtues of the design build and the virtues of private capital ameliorate in large part that, that difference between the public and private sectors. You know, the, sort of on the same, same line of thinking, uh, besides the, kind of the operational and the construction, it's also a planning element, right? The planning for all of these projects to, uh, you know, to, to be implemented has taken decades to do. MTA is not really a planning operation. Port Authority is not a planning operation in and of itself. The RPA, Regional Plan Association, of which you are currently the chair, has been easing into that role somewhat. And you put out a, a plan last year called Crossing the Hudson, along with your um, annual or your quadrennial regional plan, I guess it is, as well. Um, it, it is, what is RPA 
currently looking at as the sort of three or four major items on the agenda that are not being addressed by the transit agencies themselves. So, so the RPA is a non-for-profit uh, um, group that focuses on long-term, as I said, planning. And what, one of the benefits is, is that when you work in public agencies and you make public policy, you generally have to think about election cycles, right? We spoke about that a lot today. It's the pragmatic reality. And the objective of the RPA is to not think about election cycles, and they come out with 25-year plans. And this, we just issued our fourth plan, so we've now uh, been 100 years of, of issuing uh, plans. Uh, but the, the theory is to have some short-term suggestions. So some of the things that we talked about here today, congestion pricing, uh, the concept of uh, you know, public benefit corporations for uh, construction projects are in the plan, but as well as some broader, longer-term goals so that as, as policymakers make decisions in the short term, they have a longer term roadmap with, from which to follow. And so that's the objective behind it. Um, you know, we've been trying to get it to be also more of an advocacy group. And I think one of the things that has been interesting is we have much more of the private sector uh, now as part of RPA board members. All the major companies in New York and New Jersey and, uh, and Connecticut have joined on because they recognize that infrastructure is, is not just a, a concept, it's the quality of life, it's what enables them to attract talent and employees for them to be able to have a place that they can afford to live, and these are all things that are tied together, and that's really health and wellness, et cetera, so that's all tied together in, uh, in this plan and is of great concern to all of the stakeholders in the region. Hey, Howard, I just wanted to make one point since there are lots of your students in the room. There is a generational change going on at Rick's agency and the mm -hmm. MTA and others and there's an incredible opportunity for your students and folks like it, millennials who are interested in, in, in transportation, and the ability to, for instance, be Andy Byford and run the subways and run the buses, or to be Rick Cotton and to run the Port Authority, or to build the second stage of uh, Second Avenue. It's an incredible opportunity, and there's this generational change going on, and tech-savvy, smart, sophisticated, uh, hunter-educated millennials are gonna have an incredible I would get the resumes ready to go right now, guys. That's, that's what I think. So let me uh, let me interweave with some questions that we have um, from our from our guests. I'm going to start with one um, from uh, Yokiyoshi Naguchi, who I believe is our guest from the Japanese consulate, uh, if I'm not mistaken, who is working on infrastructure there. And his question is for Mr. Foy. Mr. Foy, it's a fairly personal question, but here you go. You <laughs> you've changed your. <laughs> You've changed your job from the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey to MTA. I assume the decision-making process is different there, especially given that the Port Authority is by state, New York and New Jersey. Does that make it more difficult to govern? Uh, how do the governance structures compare between the MTA and the Port Authority? <laughs> how, how much time do you have? <laughs> So it, 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 it's, it's a great question. Here's the answer. Governance at the Port Authority, and I'll note that Vice Chairman Linford's here and my colleague Lee Shee, both of whom are commissioners of the Port Authority here. Look, they're, they're different. And organizations adapt to the governance uh, dynamic that exists. And I'll, I'll be real brief and I'll be interested in Rick's thoughts, right? The basic dynamic at the Port Authority is an equal number of commissioners from each state and gubernatorial vetoes on the, on the part of each state which creates a reality, unless the organizations are rational, you don't take things forward unless they've been vetted with Trenton and, sorry, you don't take big things forward, right, unless they've been vetted with Albany and Trenton or else you're just wasting your time and that, that's an irrational dynamic. So I don't, and I'd be interested in Joe's thoughts and maybe I'll just keep myself out of trouble and defer to Joe, but <laughs> the, uh, actually that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> so, all right, ha ha having failed at that, <laughs> the, the dynamic at the, uh, the MTA is different, and I, I have to say, I, I spent a couple years on the board of the MTA uh, before I went to the port. It was an incredible experience. I, I sat between uh, Norman Seabrook and Chuck Mordler and uh, <laughs> in, enjoyed, enjoyed, every, right, enjoyed every meeting. The dynamic's different, right? There are gubernatorial appointees. There are four appointees uh, made on behalf of the, uh, the mayor of the city of New York. Uh, the Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester, and then what we call the quarter pounders, right? The uh, far suburbs, we've got a, a, a quarter of a vote. And uh, the... Um, Just to clarify that, so there's 23 members, six don't vote, 17 voting members, but 14 votes. So if you can follow that... And, and to, to, to further complicate that, 
Th there's a thing called a capital plan review board in which the yeah. governor or the speaker and the Senate majority leader and the mayor of the city of New York, open paren, with respect to New York City projects, closed paren, have got vetoes of the capital plan. Uh, the Is that capital a one vote? Is it a one vote veto? Yes, yeah, a one yeah. vote veto. Yeah. yeah. Right, exactly. So th that that creates an interesting dynamic. And, and the other difference between the Port Authority and the MTA is really fundamental, right, and affects the culture. The Port Authority is self-sustaining. Uh, the Port Authority's EBITDA operating profit was like $2.2 billion last year under Rick's, uh, my watch and uh, Rick's watch total. That's, pr that's pretty good. The uh, MTA basically breaks even. We have to by statute, but we're dependent on aid from the city of New York and the state of New York. The state of New York's made the largest contribution to the MTA ever. And that affects the culture, I, I believe, of the Port Authority and the MTA both. You want to speak? Yeah, the, the cultures are very, very different. I mean, in, in, and it's evolved over time. When Pat was on the board, there wasn't this state city back and forth that's going on today that happens now. Um, and so, you know, you have to be, you know, when you, when you talk about 23 different members, the amount of time that I spend paying attention to what happens at every single board meeting is extraordinary. You cannot take your eye off the ball because at any different point in time, the control can shift even within the meeting. Um, and, you know, the, the structure is, um, you know, Pat actually mentioned the fact that, you know, the MTA doesn't break even. We basically have about 50% of our revenues come from fare and tolls. The remainder comes from taxes of all different types. And that, that goes, and, and it's not unique to New York. Every uh, major transit agency in the country, MBTA in Boston, Chicago, wherever, uh, all are subsidized by the state because no elected official wants to do what London did, and that is, London and this government in England ended all subsidies to the underground. And the underground right now, um, if you were to go, you know, they have variable pricing, but if you were to go the equivalent of Times Square to Wall Street, it's a, in the current conversion, it's about $8.50 compared to what we charge because they are, uh, they're not subsidized by the government. So, I mean, that's the, that's the trade-off that goes on. There's a cost to it. I just, yeah, I'm sitting on both boards. I would say that being on the Port Authority board felt like it was in a combination of the show Scandal and uh, Borwick Empire. And uh, the MTA is a little more like West Side Story. <laughs> that's pretty good, by the way, I have to say. Uh, we have time for just a couple more questions. I might do another one from the audience, a very important issue. Um, New York City can be a very difficult place to get around, even under the best of circumstances. And for our disabled community, the challenges are tremendous. We have 355 stations that are not accessible. The Accessoride uh, system, which provides door-to-door -door service and is a lifeline for many people, is still can be difficult to navigate. What what is what is the primary issue here? Is it just money? Is it prioritization? Is it the age of the subway stations, which you know, are getting on 120 years old now. Um, I know you hear a lot about this, Joe and Pat, at the board yeah. meetings now. It's a combination of all, of all of that. One, it is money, and we've got money uh, in the current capital budget to take another 25 stations and make them handicap accessible. Uh, we are going to, in our new capital plan, have a major focus on it. We've put together a working group between management and the board to figure out how to expand accessibility throughout the region uh, overall. Uh, I also, and, and this is the part that a lot of people, you know, especially the advocates, some of our stations are very narrow, and to be able to build down to the platform level becomes very, very difficult, especially in the older part of the station, in at stations in lower Manhattan. That being said, we have to find a way to try. The federal government has certain rules about the size of the elevator. We need to work with them and get waivers to be able to get smaller elevators and not build these, uh, you know, the these large elevators that end up on the street level. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of things that need to be done and we're in the process of doing it. I recognize uh, the disabled community deserves to have access to the subway system as well as everything in New York the way everybody does. Yeah, the two things I'd add is Andy Byford, who's the rock star who just got hired to run New York City Transit. He's really a rock star. He, he's gonna be amazing. He's worked in London, Australia, and then uh, ran Toronto. Uh, he's got four equal priorities. One of his equal priorities is increasing accessibility and coming up, uh, coming up with a plan. That's really important. The other thing is just to give you some scope, near uh, President uh, Reb claimed ownership of the subway station uh, n nearby here. And from a financial point of view, we're, we're happy to hear that. The, 
there's a big accessibility project going on at the Hunter College Station. Uh, just to give you some idea, is it going on? It's going on. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> it, just to give you some idea of the scope, and every station's different, it's a hundred million dollar project, right? That, 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 that's extraordinary. Uh, and uh, the board and Joe are committed. We're, we're also, I think, very focused on paratransit. Uh, Joe created a board committee uh, on paratransit. I'm working with that board. And we held a forum just a couple of days ago with, uh, with advocates, uh, in including uh, Commissioner Calise, who works for uh, uh, the mayor. He's uh, in charge of the mayor's office of people with uh, uh, disabilities. He sent out an amazing, uh, amazing tweet. Uh, we're going to be announcing some, uh, you know, significant improvements to paratransit. Uh, we now post the data for paratransit trips on the website since uh, since uh, December or January, uh, and uh, th both of those, uh, Howard, are real focus. Great. Well, we will come to our last question. Uh, I want to mention that there is a reception following uh, the panel upstairs in the Four Freedoms Room. I think on the main floor, and we invite you all to join us for that for a few minutes. So, uh, we'll take one more question. This is for Joe Loda, <laughs> because you had all the easy ones so far. Mr. Loda, New Yorkers demand to know, what are your final four picks? <laughs> <laughs> all right, we don't really have to answer that. Georgetown is neither in the final, in the uh, NCA or the NIT. I have you have no interest whatsoever, that's very good. <laughs> Please join me in thanking our panel for a, a real conversation. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Raphael, Bren, and my class. I want to say, I want to, say to our panelists, first, I think Ted Spirit was very, very much in the room, and I think his family will agree to Professor Glazer. Uh, you're really good at this. Um, <laughs> I think we'll it's check, only a one-year contract, we'll by the way. We'll check, our ra we'll, we'll check your ratings on Rate My Professor, but uh, so far. Um, to our panelists, these are incredibly challenging issues, and I think I'm joined by the audience and just being encouraged by the intelligence and the commitment and the passion uh, for which you're addressing them. Um, and I just want to say, for not surprising at all, for Rick Cotton, because his mother went to Hunter, so that really, <laughs> that, that explains that. Um, and the most important, I think, is just this sense of the passion that you all have for public service. So much of what all of you in this panel are doing is not compensated. It's for because of your love of this city and of the public service. And I can think of no better example for our student body. The Hunter motto is mihi cura futuri. The care of the future is mine. You exemplify that with your intelligence, your passion, and your commitment to public service. And on behalf of the Hunter community, we thank you so much for your service. Thank you. Thank you, guys.